Good morning. Thanks, Richard. Tough last name to handle, right? It's a small window in Spanish, Ventanilla. Okay. Anyway, uh, I'm here to show you something. Port congestion is a lot about containerized shipping. But uh, I'm privileged to address this whole group because uh, we have been addressing a lot of uh, these forums in Subic and even as far as Batangas. NYK Group is heavy into shipping and logistics. The picture you see here is a 5,000-unit uh, 5, car carrier vessel that goes through Batangas. We have built 6,000 car carrier ships, which actually dock in Batangas. To give you an, an idea what a car carrier is, it's like a parking mall in uh, SM, fit 6,000 cars in it and make it a ship. So those things are going through Batangas already. And uh, in, uh, in a simple way, it's a big mothership already going to Batangas. Normally, these ships have 12 floors, and they are adjustable, so you can bring cars in and out. Okay, so containerized shipping is actually not the whole world when you move the cargo. So I was happy when SGS was also discussing about brake bulk. So we'll show you different aspects of shipping and how we can uh, create a vision together. So the agenda we have today is global and regional trends, domestic updates, a huge part Christian already uh, tackled, then what opportunities we can uh, grow together in this one and how, uh, in a simple way, an international shipping company is doing uh, some small developments in the country. Okay. So in a global perspective, we have to transport ourselves outside the country. Okay, this is how it looks like. Cargo volume has gone up. This is in TEUs. But uh, in a global scale, less than 50% is moving in containers. A huge portion is still moving in bulk and in car carriers. Okay, so 5.2% is the ending number in 2015. And you, if you would notice the blue line that's the Asia trade, okay? So forecast for next year, it's a, another increase of 5.4%. And then in terms of capacity, how do shipping lines respond, okay? We continue to grow our capacity. So uh, these are graphs for the last two years and what you expect in the next two years. There would be an 8% increase in capacity. And we will continue to build big ships, okay? So the big ships that you see here, okay, are uh, most of them are over 10,000 TU ship size. If you would notice the red line, those are the ships we continue to build today. And I'm showing you more pictures because you'll never see the ships in the Philippines yet. Okay, so uh, this is the NYK Helios. It's a 14,000 TU ship but it's the average uh, size that is going on the Asia-Europe market already. So why do we build big ships? It will be a lower cost per TU for everybody, fuel efficient, environmental friendly. These ships are quite massive, okay? So if you put them on land, uh, the Eiffel Tower, it's longer than the Eiffel Tower, and uh, these are some things that uh, are being built today, like the 18,000 TEU ship and the 19,000 TEU ship have been launched already. And uh, yeah, you just fly to Hong Kong or Singapore one hour from here, you'll see these massive ships, okay? So these ships are quite big and actually, uh, normally if you lay a football field on the deck, you have four times the football field. And since we're not into football, we're into basketball, so more than 36 courts of basketball courts. So these are things that I'm just trying uh, to tell you, like, uh, why am I showing you this? So that all of us, majority of us here are Filipinos. Uh, we can share a simple vision, which I have for the last uh, few decades, and actually how to bring these massive ships so that we can perk up our economy, okay? So these massive ships we continue to build. Oh, sorry, there's uh, 
something there. Anyway, when we continue to build the ships, the average ship size is 3,350 already. Okay. It's small compared to a 14,000 TU. But when we brought our 3,000 TU ship here in Manila, last 2010, everybody was saying it's massive. But come on, we have to think beyond what we can bring. So uh, this one we brought in last April 2010. And actually, uh, uh, I, I like this ship because uh, it has a Danielle name in it. So, so it's quite cute. My kid thought it was named after me. I told him it's uh, Daniela. So <laughs> ships are named after women. Lucky for the, for the girls out here. Okay, so uh, in NYK, we never lose sight of this vision. We try to bring in the biggest ship we can, we can uh, carry because it will benefit the market in the long term. Okay, so as of this time, we have to be content about the Philippines being a feeder port. This vessel is what we call a feeder max vessel. So we have to make do with what we have. Okay? But in Asia, Asia continues to grow. I showed you the blue graph. Over 446.7 million TUs are handled in Asia. And we continue to upsize the ship. So in 2008, there were only 35 Panamax vessels. And in 2014, more than 83 Panamax vessels are operating in the region. What's a Panamax vessel? It is a, a right-sized vessel that can fit the Panama Canal. And that Panama Canal is being expanded because post-Panamax vessel like 14,000 to 18,000 is being built. So if you would notice, the size there is around 4,848 TU. So that's the new average in Asia ongoing. Where are we in the Philippines? So I think those are the things... Uh, which we need to uh, take from this point, okay? So for the containerized shipping. Okay, so we are in a phase of uh, building a capacity and infrastructure to accommodate the ships. Like uh, Chris said that uh, Manila port is a world-class terminal. Uh, uh, we agree on that, and even Subic. Uh, the challenges we also have to face through are uh, how do we accommodate these big ships into both the big ports in Manila and Subic. Our Asian neighbors are quite, quite uh, fast to respond. So these are the investments they are giving in the next few years. So you would notice Singapore, despite handling more than 32 million TEUs, continue to build more uh, berths at the PSA. And Indonesia which is like uh, we always similarly compared ourselves in terms of geographic or uh, how to say that, how uh, we are connected with so many islands, continue to build. And they were quite bold in building uh, 18 million TEUs by 2023. Thailand, which is also we compare ourselves, uh, is already uh, going, they are accommodating uh, big ships and they are even building something on the western seaboard with Myanmar. Okay, and of course, uh, Philippines, the best bet we have in the next two years is the NLEX SLEX connector. It's good, but uh, uh, I think that is what the infrastructure on roads we can have. And thankfully, the government uh, had BERT 7 at MICT. Okay, so we need more infrastructure. And ASEAN actually is where the money is being put in. So this is our uh, uh, foreign direct investments in the last few years. And you would notice 2013, there are more FDIs into ASEAN and beating China. So China was only 117. But uh, one thing noticeable this time is China is becoming a big investor. And even not only in ASEAN, but also in Africa. Okay. So we call this the factory Asia phenomenon where uh, ASEAN countries are trying to work together. These are the absolute figures. You would notice uh, we still need to work some more, but I think uh, Philippines is doing good, but we still need more work on this one. And that's why we, get, we need to get our act together. And one thing I really want what's happening in ASEAN is uh, anytime soon, it becomes uh, a single window by 2015. 
Uh, I know the big question about costons, and I just heard from SGS another ruling on on how to facilitate goods, uh, getting more papers. That's something we don't need right now if we are to uh, integrate with the ASEAN countries. Well, hopefully, we will be forced to buy a good system in costoms and we can get things going. And I think uh, you have to push every, everybody in the government to do that. Uh, my honest opinion, anyway, is uh, uh, if customs is really uh, uh, getting more than billions of money from Filipino people, importer, exporter, why don't you just buy a nice IBM system or wherever where we can run it? I think you can easily, uh, how to say, uh, get the crooks out, the smugglers out by buying the system. So I think uh, it will be driven by infrastructure and technology, and hopefully uh, we can lessen the red tape. So for intra-regional ASEAN, this is how it will impact us. Uh, Philippines is not the country doing many trade with the ASEAN countries today. Actually, the average is around 24, we're just 19. And for export, we're doing not so good. But of course, our market is uh, Japan and Korea. We can easily do these things together because uh, as uh, international shipping, we easily connect countries. We go where the market is. So you would notice we have one service that connects Philippines to Japan and the other ASEAN countries. Philippines can easily be a gateway by establishing services that can cater to the market. So now I focus on the Philippines, but actually I'll uh, skip a lot of the slides because... Uh, uh, a, a huge discussion was also in the truck already. The population continues to grow, so we are good. When the population continues to grow, there's a really a huge chance of more movements, container movements or non-containerized coming in and out of the country, but mostly coming in. Okay. This one is an interesting slide. I'll just show you. Um, if you look at Manila which is the primary port, and you add Subic and Batangas, which makes up Luzon, 78% of the total volume of the Philippines go through these three ports in Luzon. So if you look at the numbers about import and export, easily you will come up with a figure of three containers in and one container out. So technically, shipping lines have to handle the two TEUs of empty every day for every cargo coming in. So if you, uh, what, uh, what was just said, if empties weren't taken for granted in the last few months, you build up a lot of uh, empty depots and empty outside Manila, and we were not handling our empties well. So these are challenges that was created by the Manila truck ban. And of course, uh, concerns uh, happened uh, in the last few months due to congestion. This one is the capacity of the cranes. The cranes are doing good. Uh, plans were, were being done in order to uh, hasten Subic and Batangas. For the last two years, NYK is trying to drive the market how we can create more traffic through Subic and Batangas because there are exporters and importers within that zone is not using Subic and Batangas but is using Manila. So what we're trying to do is how do we uh, match together? And if you would notice the capacity in Manila is really high already with 5% cargo volume coming in. And that's why in NYK we have a tipping point maybe around 2014 or 2015 that there would be congestion. But it happened earlier because of the declaration of a truck ban by ERAP. Anyway, I think this one is history. This is how Arab uh, look into the truck van and the revisions, which handle the empty. Okay, and even the empties were closed at ICTSI. So in short, it affected the turnaround of trucks. Each event happened, and as mentioned earlier, more than 50% of the truck traffic was gone. So what did we do? Of course, uh, for some companies, like for NYK, we have uh, seen that the the, import, the empty deliveries are critical because of the current ratio for the last few years. So immediately after the truck ban, we immediately uh, open up our depot 
which we own and operate. Uh, last March, we declared it 24 hours and open even on Sundays. But believe me, not so many pull out on a Sundays. So why open it? So the question is, how do we sustain this all, all these things? So we even created uh, pockets of depots by using common depots outside Manila. And actually, for the last few years, we have been using an ICD south of Manila, which we hope to expand in uh, next year. And of course, uh, if you drive the empties uh, between Manila and Subic and Batangas, we can easily bring our ships in Subic and Batangas. Okay. This is our depot in Manila. Actually, it's well managed. So because of the ratio of the market, we really want the turnaround of uh, containers very uh, accurately. So we just adjusted so that there's no problem. Depots of today are operated like a Spider-Man. Like somebody is just uh, on top of a container and they were putting in hooks on the corners of a container. So this one is uh, actually operated with the side lifters or side loaders. Okay. This one is more of the congestion. I'll just explain to you. If the dwell time increased, the crane productivity goes down because there's no, not so much uh, space inside the port. And the problem is the vessels are operated longer than 24 hours, so some of them uh, stay longer or wait for their berth. So that's the reason why some immediately other shipping lines omit Manila. But for NYK, we are committed because uh, it's a Japan government and Philippine government thing. So for NYK, is very much committed in creating new markets uh, given the ports that were built under JICA. Okay, this is the thing that we did in Batangas. We launched it last because July was a critical month already due to the request of some of our consignees and uh, exporters. We launched a Batangas service, actually. Actually, it's the only service that never passed by Manila. So it was a bet we did. So we had a call last July. So we did a direct call. Everything was okay. But today, actually, Batangas port had its challenges, so we had to, uh, to see how we can uh, develop this market. On the side, actually, Batangas is our major uh, car hub. We bring more than uh, 5,000 cars a month through this facility. So uh, in a way, uh, we continue to be a container operator in Batangas, and we have to do it with the other lines, uh, making them as feeder operator. Government action was uh, finally coming after a few months of dialogue. So most of their actions came in in the third quarter, if you would notice. Then uh, finally, ERAP uh, lifted the truck ban, but it's uh, more of the backlogs already. The Subic and Batangas extension as Manila port, it's nice to hear. There was an EO172 declared. But uh, unfortunately, uh, we need to see the implementing guidelines. So today, we cannot move much uh, given the situation as international shipping lines. It's very important for us international shipping lines to manage our empties or our equipment in between ports. But we need government help on that one because uh, things need to be revisited like the cabotage law and everything, which is definitely outdated as of today. It has to be more or less... Uh, uh, revised. Then in September, they approve uh, facilities outside Manila and the uh, increase in storage fee. So the question is, when does the uh, port congestion ease out? So hopefully by early 2015, definitely not November, December. Okay, so how do we do ourselves or help ourselves in the next two or three months? So for things like Subic, I've shown you big ships. Subic is quite a nice port. NYK has been there. We are co cooperating with some feeder operators linking Subic and Kaohsiung. And as mentioned, the Subic is uh, declared an extension. But because of the deep natural draft, we can bring in bigger vessels, the 4,000 or the 5,000 TEU size. If we are able to do that, the cost per TEU really goes down. Okay. And it's a good thing. It's managed by one government of SBMA, 
So they are even thinking of how to develop the road traffic beyond the current. So uh, we look forward to them pouring more money on how to develop Subic. And this is the current port by this time that's practically filled up. And there are areas outside the port that they can have a storage. And the good thing about Subic is there's more room for expansion. And the road connectivity, well, that was uh, funded by the Japan government and the Philippines, is uh, seamless. Although a lot of trucks do not pass by the SCTEX, they still pass by the old road. And then uh, the deep natural draft is one thing we look forward to. And this is our ticket if we are to bring in the big vessels into the Philippines. And this was our uh, first call in Subic. It happened last Sunday. So what we did in Subic is we created new markets for Subic. So there's now a Japan direct to Subic, a Subic direct to Singapore, and a Subic direct to Vietnam. So it links ASEAN and the Japan markets together. So hopefully we will have more calls by December and January 2015. Okay. And of course, moving forward, Chris mentioned this. Earlier, we hoped there would be a facility south of Manila that can uh, ease up the congestion by the first quarter of next year. So how do international shipping lines uh, create this? We, I talk a lot about containerized shipping, which is really in Manila. South of Manila, we have our car carriers in Batangas. This is our cars being driven up to a car carrier, as big as 5,000. And then south of Manila, there's a lot of reefer market and a lot of reefer vessels coming in. So there are uh, reefer vessels as big as uh, uh, that you can put in all bananas you have going to Japan, actually. And north of Philippines, we have a lot of other types of carriers like ore carriers and even LNG type carriers, which we will introduce by 2016. Okay. The market is just not ready, so uh, all ships are available. Uh, NYK operate 880 ships, so I think uh, for containerized, we're less than 150 ships are containerized shipping. So in the Philippines, we're uh, more than 38 years already, and it's part of the Mitsubishi group. So we're not only into shipping, but the good thing is we're also ship management. So one thing we need to do as Filipinos here is how do we bring back those good seafarers operating those massive ships and bring those knowledge and how do we uh, ask them to develop our country as well. So we have the human resources here. And of course, we have logistics to make sure the ships get out of uh, the port immediately. And I'll just uh, share to you some things we can easily do. We are able to do it in other businesses because TDG is a logistics division. We have uh, over 16,000 employees. And we're into various things, including air freight. If you would notice in Batangas, this is how we did. We created an auto hub. Actually, we have two facilities in Batangas, in Bawan and Santa Clara. Although Santa Clara today is congested with containers. So we are able to bring in the big uh, car ships uh, this way in Batangas. And it's quite efficient for the last 12 years. And it goes beyond shipping. You have to bring the cars out. So we have car facilities. We have more than five uh, serving various clients. And not only for cars, but also for motorcycles. The car industry continues to develop around 27% uh, each year. That's the growth uh, we, we have seen uh, this year on the car industry. So we continue to innovate on transport of cars. So cars stuck on top of each other. On the Container Depot, we did this uh, 14 years ago, oh, 17 years ago. So it's uh, still the modern depot in Manila. And we also do our chassis. For nickel ore, which is the brake bulk thing, uh, or the bulk thing SGS was saying, uh, we transport a lot of nickel outside, going outside of the Philippines. Actually, in terms of tonnage, the bigger port than Manila is actually in Surigao, because that's where the, a lot of... Uh, nickel exports are going out. And of course, technology is very important. That's why NYK have also uh, doing the centralized uh, BL customer service and booking function worldwide of NYK in the Philippines. Anyway, it's harnessing the BPO technology. And it's a PQA awardee company, and we're proud of that. 
And these things are also being featured what we have done in the Philippines, outside the Philippines by NYK, through the magazines in Forbes Times and everything. So in a nutshell, that's how we do things in NYK and how a simple international shipping can make uh, good developments in automotive and hopefully we can do much on the containerized business. And this is sustainable because our commitment is not only to develop gateways like Subic, Batangas, but we're also committed to, uh, to uh, bring up the manpower. This is a school of officers in Laguna, so we have 120 students each year. So our, our vision is in 15 years, these captains or chief mates will come back here and hopefully uh, they can add more input on their experiences overseas and maybe our logistics footprint will be better than it is today. And of course, we're committed to the future. These are ships of today, but actually they are more uh, futuristic with solar panels on top of it, more of the car carriers. And uh, we had an echo ship of 2030, we, we launched in 2012, but uh, more or less, this is a vision and technology is being driven on how to make these ships uh, more efficient and more environment friendly. So in a nutshell, those are the things we do in NYK. Thank you.